means so much and it makes a difference when you pray for people and we got several families in our church family that need our prayers and we hope you continually pray for them pray for Marie Throckmorton she's in her back row in fact to pray for her in this time in her life and then Kate Blevins um, he's away today because of sickness but he's back here in this section and then Karen Kunda needs our prayers and her family so pray for us when we go through these times in our life and we'll probably all get our turn amen Amen. But thank you for your prayers and continue to pray and we're getting stronger. Today, Brother Matt is away, family in Florida, and we think we should go and be with him. Anybody like that? <laughs> and so we got a completely new crew up here uh, this morning singing and playing, and you'll be blessed, and God will move in a special way. Brother Dan York will be speaking today, and I'm looking forward to that and to his preaching for the day, and we're going to enjoy his preaching. Aren't you glad to be here? Can you raise your hand? Amen. We're glad you're here. Man, it's a good-looking crowd. Brother Ed is going to make our prayer this morning. And when you come to a service, I think it's important to prepare your own heart to listen to the Lord. We're all so busy, and we've got our challenges in our life. And so we've got to make an adjustment to get our mind and our heart in order to get ready to receive the Word. So as you come to a service, you know, a pastor, a speaker, he'll prepare his heart and get his heart in order. Most of the time, it takes me longer to get my heart right than it does to get the message, you know. So you, you get your heart right, and the message will find its way. Brother Ed, invite the Lord's presence today in our service. Won't you do that? Heavenly Father, we come to you in prayer this morning, Lord, with thankful hearts, Lord, for all you've done in our lives, and Lord, in our families, and just how you bless us, Lord. We pray, Lord, this morning for the Holy Spirit to visit here and uh, to speak to our hearts, Lord, and uh, be with Brother Dan as he brings the message, and uh, just pray you bless him and give him wisdom, Lord, and, and freedom to speak your word. Pray for all the sick and our midst, uh, Lord, our church family here. We're all interconnected, and Lord, we just uh, love each other, and pray, Lord, that uh, we could pick each other up and just uh, carry each other in our hearts. And we pray for your blessing, Lord, on the ones that are having surgery this week, uh, the ones that need uh, your healing touch on their bodies. Lord, we just pray for each and every soul, each and every family, Lord. We just pray now you'd uh, uh, just go with us uh, today, Lord, bless uh, the singing and the and the word that you're about to give us, and bless Steve as he uh, leads the songs today, and bless our pastor, and bless Matt down in Florida too, Lord, just be with each of them, and uh, just strengthen them, Lord, and, and uh, just lead them, Lord. Thank you for all you do, and we praise you in Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning. You know, I am so pleased this morning to see uh, Michaela and Josie up here um, uh, just uh, helping us, uh, leading us in worship today and, and serving. So thank you very much for doing that. It's, uh, it's wonderful to see them uh, serve in that way. So I want to read a scripture this morning. Get these in the right place here. I lost my place. There we go. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell, in having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him I say whether they be in earth, things in earth or things in heaven. Are you happy, you glad for what Jesus did on the cross, for what God did on the cross? We're going to sing about that now. If you are a first-time visitor... We'd like you to stay seated, but if, uh, if you're a first-time uh, visitor, stay seated. One of our ushers will find you and give you a visitor's card. Everyone else, let's stand up. Let's uh, sing. We're going to sing uh, at Calvary. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified.
going to sing it's glory to glory when we think about what Jesus did on the cross bringing us to salvation offering us that salvation and this song sings about what Jesus is doing in our life what God's doing in our life changing us helping us to walk closer to him so reflect on that as we sing this song, Glory to Glory, this morning.
this morning. We've had such a good, a good number of songs that have been a blessing to us recently. This is a song that we've, it's been a while since we've sung this here in the Holy. It's one we used to sing quite a bit. And this, I'd like you to just uh, let this song quiet your spirit and worship the Lord as we sing this song. Prepare your heart for the message. Sandy's going to be singing for us just here in a few minutes, ministering to us some music. Let's prepare our hearts as we, uh, as we get ready for the message, all right? This is where the hands
Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day to be in your house, to sing your praise. If we didn't sing your praise, Lord, the rocks and trees would cry out. And we just, we just praise your name. You are worthy of all praise, honor, and glory. So, Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness to us, how you change us, how you instruct us and guide us. And so, Lord, we look forward to meeting you now in your word and through song. And we ask this in Jesus' name. that made her blind She felt such pain Some spoke in anger Heard folks whisper There's no place here for her kind Still on she came Through the shame that flushed her face Till at last she knelt before his feet And though she spoke no words Everything she said was heard And she poured her love for the master From her box of alabaster I've come to pour my praise on him oil from Mary's alabaster box. Don't be angry if I wash his feet with my tears and I dry them with my hair. You weren't there. did not feel what I felt when he wrapped his loving arms around me and you don't know the cost of the oil in my alabaster I can't forget the way life used to be I was a prisoner to the sin that had me bound I spent my days poured my life without measure into a little treasure box I thought I'd found until the day Jesus came to me and healed my soul with the wonder of His touch. So now I'm giving back to Him all the praise He's worthy of. I've been forgiven and that's why. praise on him like oil from Mary's alabaster box. Don't be angry if I wash his feet with my tears and I dry them with my
of the oil in my alabaster Thank you, Sandy. What an amazing song. My mom sings that song, and that reminded me so much of her, and just thank you for that. And Woo! We're ready to go this morning. How many of you guys enjoyed the music? Let's give a hand for our worship team again this morning. They got some big fill- shoes to fill, some of those guys. That was their uh, first time filling those roles this morning, and I thought they did a fantastic job, so I just love them, and I thank God for them and their willingness to serve Let's go ahead and turn your Bibles this morning. It's such an honor to get to speak for you this morning, uh, to get to do it. I'm going to be this morning and I'll be tonight, all right? And so if I don't see you there tonight, I'll definitely know how I did this morning, all right? So I'm looking forward to tonight's service as well. But turn in your Bibles to uh, Galatians chapter 1. And while you're turning there, I want to ask a question. I have a question I I want you to answer for me. Have you ever had to call 911? Whoa. Have you ever been there before? Now, I'm not talking about the times when you, uh, when you accidentally call, all right? When you accidentally sit on your phone at home on the emergency call button and, uh, and you know, the police are on the phone. Or if you're like me, I got a call one day. I was sitting at home and I got a call back from the police department and they said, hey, we just got a call from you. Are you okay? And I'm like, I'm fine. Well, of course, it was just a few minutes earlier that my little daughter uh, Becca was playing with my phone, and she found that emergency keypad, you know, and she just goes to town on that thing, and uh, eventually gets the combination right, you know, and so, uh, but, you know, it's, I'm not talking about that, I'm talking about, have you ever had to call 911 for something serious, right, have you been there before? I've been there many times in my life, unfortunately, I've had to call 911, and I want to tell you about one of those times in my life, it was 2012, we were very young in our church plant in Columbus, Ohio, and we were out one day, and this was very young. We had a few men that we would hang out with during our uh, week, and we would do uh, different things together. On this particular day, it was a springtime day. It was hot. It was a beautiful day out. But we were at the park, and we were playing basketball. And we were just enjoying our time, and in one of those moments, I just noticed a young boy, and there was many families out there. They were playing on the playgrounds, and they were hanging out, having a good time, just enjoying their day. Some, some of you may have did yesterday. And we were out, and we were just enjoying our time. And I just noticed this young boy, he was headed, running to his car. His, car, his, his parents had parked their car on the curb next to the playground. Nothing wrong with that. And so he's running to his car to go get in his car. And I, I look back. The dad is wrangling with some other kids. Parents, you know what that's like, all right, if you're, if you're a parent in here. But this young boy, and he's no bigger than my, probably my three-year-old Sammy. He's no bigger than him. And he runs to the car, and uh, he finds the car that's on the curbside locked, the door locked. And so he thinks, well, I'm just going to run around to the other side. And he does not notice the car that is zooming past this playground coming on the other side of that car. And what happens is, is he rounds the corner of that car to check the other side of the, to uh, see if the door is unlocked. And that car and him come face to face. And he doesn't understand, he doesn't understand why, you know, what's happening in that moment. But all he sees and all I see and all we see at this playground that has just seen this moment happen is we see this boy get clipped by this car and he and his shoes go in completely, completely different directions. And they're completely different and he goes sliding up on the curb and immediately, I'm there in like three seconds, and immediately we're there, and the dad is distraught, and I'm like, I got to call 911. So I get my phone out, I push 911, and I throw it in there, and they answer. I said, a young boy has just been hit by a car. He's not awake. Here's where we are. Please hurry. It's urgent, urgent. Please hurry. And so and as we're waiting for this uh, ambulance to show up, of course, a, a crowd has gathered. This boy is completely unconscious at this time. And before the EMS gets there, he does wake up for just a moment. And he asks his dad, what happened? And he said, you've been hit. Just don't move. Stay down. Help is on the way. And by the time the EMS comes, a crowd's gathered. They pick this boy up. They put him on a, uh, one of those neck brace boards. And they, they whiz him off, off to the hospital. And we're sitting there. 
and us men and stuff, we're there, and you know, we were there at the scene, and we had no idea what to do. We just prayed. We just prayed, God, please don't, please allow this boy to live. We don't even know his name, but please, Lord, just uh, just be with this boy. And after everything is said and done, and they've taken him off to the hospital, us men finish. We pack up. I go to my car, and it's just in this moment I have this. I'm still like sort of reeling in this moment. I still can remember actually his brother go and pick his brother. His older brother go and pick his shoes up, and they're like 30, 40 feet away from where he was. And I just remember this moment, and I'm sitting in my car, and it messed me up mentally for a, quite a while, because I still didn't know. None of us knew this boy. We didn't have a name. We didn't know where he, how he was doing, if he was alive, if he was going to make it. We didn't know anything. And it really did mess me up mentally for a long time. How bad was he hurt? Didn't even know his and so, uh, and it wasn't a few months later, we actually uh, got to hear that uh, one of the men who, li- who uh, was with us at that park, his parents live in that neighborhood, and they know of that boy, they knew of the accident. And they, they were able to report to us that they did see him uh, a few months down the road. He had a cast on his left arm and his left leg, but he was alive and going around and was okay. And I'm like, whew, man. But I'm just saying, in that moment, I remember it. It was unbelievably intense, that moment. And I know you're asking now, why in the world would you start with that story? And I'm going to tell you why. The reason I start with a story like that is because that is what Galatians is. If you've ever read the book of Galatians before, you have an idea of what it is. Galatians is Paul writing a 911 letter to the church it's that level of urgency. It's that big a deal. Now before we get started into the text, we're going to read chapter 1 in a moment. And we're going to see how serious it is, how urgent it is, how important it is. But i got a question I want to ask too. What happens if no one calls 911 that afternoon? What happens if no one... Now I know there are other people there and they probably had their phones and they could have called. But I, I know what would have happened if no one called 911 that afternoon. We're talking casualty. We're talking life lost. And the same is here in Galatians and I want you to see it here. If no one, if Paul doesn't write this letter to the church in Galatia, we're talking casualties. We're talking spiritual casualties are going to happen all over the city of Galatia. And so we jump into our text here in just a second, and I want you to feel that. I want you to take that in, because this is Paul coming up on a scene that is 911 level emergency. And he's going to speak with 911 intensity and 911 seriousness. And I want you to know that this morning and tonight's service, they're going to be good news. We're going to be talking about good news, but it's good news because there are some places and spaces that we've got to watch. Or we will soon be distracted by the enemy, the, the, it will, we will be deceived, we will be distorted, and even while we're here in the church, he will do it to us all the time. So if you got your Bible, I want you to open it up to Galatians 1. Like I said, and, I, and I'll read you six scriptures from Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 12. Okay, here's Paul. 911 letter. Emergency. Here's what he says. Galatians 1, 6-12, it says, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach in any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which is preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but the revelation of Jesus Christ. Do you feel the intensity of this? 
in Paul's words. Do you feel that this is 911? I want you, and if you've ever read any of the 12 other books and letters that Paul has written to people or churches, you know sort of Paul's deal. He always starts out with some sort of ramp up, encouraging, you know, flowery, grace and peace to you type of language. He always does that in all of his other books. He doesn't do that here in Galatians. He does not do that. Why? Because he is 911 call. You're in trouble. We're in trouble. We got to stop what we're doing right now and go back to what we know. Go back to what Jesus taught us. Urgent, urgent, urgent. So here's what I want you to jot down if you're taking notes. The reason he does this, the reason it's a 911 call is because getting the gospel right is a huge deal. It's a huge deal. Now again, I'm going to preach with intensity because we live in a world that is living with intensity right now. And I hope that that doesn't offend you, that you're okay with that. Hillsborough Bible Baptist Church, are you okay with that this morning? That I show you some intensity because it's a big deal, it's a huge deal that we get the gospel right. It's such a big deal. And they missed it. They missed it in Galatians. And here's two reasons that we've got to make sure that we get the gospel right. Two reasons to make sure we get the gospel right. Number one is this. If the church gets the gospel right, check this out. People start to experience the saving power of Jesus Christ. If the church gets the gospel right, that's what happens. That's real. That's not theoretical. That'll change your eternity. That'll change your marriage. That'll change your purpose. That'll change your career. That'll change your church. That'll change your city. That'll change your state, Ohio. That'll change Everything, if we can get the gospel right, the church gets the gospel right, everything changes. Now, here's the other piece we've got to catch. If the church gets the gospel wrong, the exact opposite happens. If the church gets the gospel wrong, we miss out. And let me tell you, this is what Paul was trying to prevent. This is why Paul wrote this letter. Here's, the, here's what we need to understand that he wants to make sure that people understand. Yes, we talk in some sort of language here at church, and we have this Christianese about us, a language that we speak, but some people will think because they speak that way that they're now saved. Some people think that they have accepted salvation because they talk like we do, or they've figured it out. Ultimately, the reason Paul writes this letter is because he didn't want people being fooled into getting the gospel or missing out eternally. This is eternally significant deal. So the church, us, Hillsborough Bible, we got to get the gospel right. We got to get it right. It's a huge deal. Let me back away a little bit and let's go to some cultural context here about Galatia and where these people were. It's a region in modern day Turkey, so you can still find it on the map today. And most scholars believe that Galatians was actually one of the earliest letters that we now find in the New Testament. So chronological timeline, we're talking like it was written 16 years after the ascension of Jesus. 16 years. And so I just want to get your mind there. Jesus defeats sin and death, all right? He on the cross, he's risen again, he finds his disciples, he says, I'm coming. I'm going to go to prepare a place for you. I'm I'm going to go to heaven. I'm going to ascend. So you go, make, baptize, teach, do all those things. And then he ascends. He goes into the air. They see him go into the air. And then 16 years, I'm I'm sorry, a few days later, the church is started. Holy Spirit shows up at Pentecost and the church is started. And then 16 years later, Galatians is written. So I want you to see, I have a question, all right? If that can happen in 16 years, what do you think has happened in 2,000 years? That's the point of this book. Martin Luther, the great reformer, would go on to say that Galatians was his favorite book of the Bible. You can imagine the church gets so distorted. It gets some way we get distracted. Politics get involved. Our agendas get involved. Other things in our life, get involved, and we need to make sure that we got our eyes and our hearts calibrated on the gospel. That's what we're talking about this morning, and that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. Come back. It's going to be encouraging. It's going to be good. You don't want to miss it, but this is what we're going to be talking about all day today. 
So if the church gets the gospel right, people experience the saving power of Jesus. The second thing that happens when the church gets the gospel right, and I love this, and I'm prepping you for an amen or a hallelujah or a hand clap or a praise the Lord. I'm prepping you. If the church gets the gospel right, God is glorified. Amen? When the church gets the gospel right, God is glorified. Yes, God gets the glory. I mean, we've tried to emphasize that so much today. Our worship team has done a fantastic job to emphasize that when you show up here, Jesus Christ, the risen Savior, our Lord, is the front page above the headline. He is the, the biggest font on the page. He is at Hillsborough Baptist Church this Sunday and every Sunday, the main thing. He is glorified. We want to glorify Him. We want to make it about Him. We want to make it about Him only. None of us, not us, we get out of the way. He takes center stage. Primary and at first importance, it's a big deal. So no secondary issue. we got to make sure we lift that at the highest level. And these service touchstones, these service places that we can sense and we can see and we can get is our way of knowing if we're getting the gospel right is if we're doing this right. So I'm going to say it again. People experience the power of salvation. Not just I got saved one time, but their entire life changed. Their family changed. Their purpose changed. Entire life changed. And God gets the glory. Those are great touchstones to know if you are getting the gospel right. But now the million dollar question in this 1040 AM service is this. What's the gospel? What's the gospel? What if I were to come down to you right now, and if you're taking notes, I want you to write that question down. What is the gospel? I want to give you like 15 seconds. I want you to put some words together. What is the gospel? Put it down. What do you know the gospel to be? What have you learned here to know the gospel to be? If I were to come down to you and make eye contact with you this morning, and I were to get one of these mics right here, and I say, you know what, Kevin, turn it up loud, all right? And I make eye contact with you, and I come down, and I say, everybody here at Hillsborough Bible wants to know what the gospel is. What is the gospel? What would you say? How would you answer that question yourself? Because this is, this is a big deal that we get it. And I've got something here today, and I I want you to see it. And I have this essential definition of the gospel because I want you to know the gospel. I don't want you to have a second guess, you know, like because you you know what? it's It's a big deal. It's important that you know the gospel because the people at your job, they might not know the gospel, and you need to tell them. Some of our college students are back from summer. You have roommates that you that came from wherever. And you think, you know what, I know them enough to know they don't know what the gospel is, and you need to tell them. That's why it's important. You know what the gospel is. You know how to respond to that question, what is the gospel? Or maybe there's somebody in your neighborhood that's maybe moved. A lot of people moving during the season. What's the gospel? What is it? Could you answer the question? So let me give you a working definition. It will be on the screen. I want you to read it with me here. It is the gospel... Read it with me. The gospel is the good news that Jesus died for our sins and rose from the dead so that through faith in him, we can be made right with God and enjoy life with him forever. That's the gospel. I want to read it one more time because I want you to catch it. It's what we're going to be using for today and and tonight. And so it's got all the essentials in there. The gospel is is the good news. It's not bad news this morning, church. It's good news that Jesus died for our sins, my sins, not my theoretical sins. He died for my sins, and He died in my place and in yours, and rose from the dead, defeating sin and death, so that through faith in Him, we can be made right with God and enjoy life with Him forever. That's the gospel. Now, we can distort it and deceive it, And in the book of Galatians, they did. They essentially believed the historical account of what Jesus had done. But you'll see tonight, exactly, we'll go into it a little deeper tonight. But some religious people (laughs) came in. 
and wanted to deceive and distort. They were called Judaizers. Basically, what they were saying was, yeah, you should believe in Jesus. Yeah, you can believe in Jesus, but you've got to keep all the Old Testament commandments and all that stuff too. You've got to make sure and get, get all that stuff together. And I want you to say, I, I, I want to say to you, and this is really what they were getting down to is this, um, because they had a bunch of Greek men that wanted to follow Jesus, a bunch of Greek men. And they're like, yeah, all you Greek men, yeah, come on over here. You want to follow Jesus? That's awesome. You just got to be circumcised first. Ooh. You just got to be circumcised first. And let me tell you, Paul was saying, no, 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 that's, that's not right. How, I, what if that happened today, all right? How would you like that today, okay? Oh, you want to follow Jesus? Oh, you're not Jewish? Okay, right after our 1040 service, you just go right over there, Rodney's classroom. We're going to circumcise some people, all right? <laughs> right after 1040, we have circumcision class. Come on over. We're going to take care of you, and then you can follow Jesus, all right? With that, that is what they're saying. That is what they're getting at. And yes, you guys groaned a little bit more there than the 911 story, but can you imagine this? And if you don't know what circumcision is, you should probably be an uprising kids right now, all right? <laughs> but this is what I want you to know. Listen, that's what they wanted to do. We're saying, oh, you can follow Jesus. You can be saved. You just got to continue following the law. And Paul was saying, and you'll feel it later, he says, absolutely not. He goes, that is what Jesus did. Jesus Christ died not to invite you into the covenant of the law, he died that you, you wouldn't have to hold that anymore. He's the one that actually fulfilled it himself. You can do nothing but receive and follow him. He's going to remove the burden of all the rights and wrongs. It's the good news, not bad news, all right? Adult circumcision, bad news. <laughs> Following Jesus, good news. Okay, enough of that, all right. Now here's what I want you to catch. Right here. Before I got to tell you another story, I, I want you to write down these words. I want you to write down the word kind, and I want you to write down the word nice. Kind and nice. And we'll talk about them in just a moment because I, I want you to know when Paul writes this, Paul is kind. Paul's words are kind. Paul is unbelievably kind. Not nice, but kind. And I want to tell you how I distinguish the difference. My wife and I, uh, we've had this ongoing game in our house for, since we've been married, all right? And I have this habit that I picked up in college that when I go to bed, I take the clothes that I'm wearing and I put them in the floor or I put them at the foot of the bed. Now, guys, we understand why we do this. You never know if you want to wear that again tomorrow, right? <laughs> You don't, you never know. It might be a pair of shorts I wore for maybe an hour. I want to wear that again. I don't have no reason to wash that again. Or maybe I got to get up and go run a robber off in the house. I don't know what's going to happen. I just know I need to get clothes on quick. So I need my clothes right there. But when me and Bethany got married, I started to notice that when I, I started to notice something, um, there was like a dirty clothes hamper that started to hover around the areas that I put my clothes. I'm like, what is this? What is... Clothes on the floor, clothes on the bed. <laughs> and then one day, Bethany finally comes to me and she goes, hey, I've got a question for you. Do you guys know that a dirty clothes hamper, like the dirty clothes, they go in the hamper. They, they go in it. And I'm like, wait a minute, what's going on here? But you know what, I, I, I finally realized she's not coming from a mean place. You know what I'm saying? She's not coming. If you know my wife, you know her heart to be true. She's a very kind person. She's a kind-hearted person. She wants to make sure that you know there's something that can be a benefit to you. <laughs> <laughs> now listen, if she was a nice person though, would she have done that? Absolutely not, because nice people will lie to you. Nice people will lie right to your face. There's a lot of nice people in our world today. There's a lot of nice people at your office. There's a lot of nice people that will talk to you about how you should be dating. 
There's a lot of nice people that t- will talk to you about how you should probably get out of your marriage. There's a lot of nice people that will be nice to you and lie straight to your face and not be truthful with you. And they're nice, but they're not honest. And there's nice people. Let me tell you, they're scary. this is scary. There's nice preachers. And there's nice churches. And that's scary. And the point that Paul writes to the church in Galatia, and he has so much love in his heart, like an under-shepherd, he wants to make sure that the eternity of people that cares the way they're living their life, he wants to make sure that they understand the gospel. And so he is not going to be nice. And our people out in the world today, they will be nice. Politicians will be nice to you. People will take offense to everything. I know I live in that space. But I want you to understand, surround yourself with kind people. And be a kind person that can be trusted in the relationships that you're in. This is what Paul is trying to get to these people. He is being this for them. The Old Testament was full of nice prophets. And they would sit there and be like, everything's fine, guys. Everything's fine. And everything is not fine. They were full of them. I want you to see this. Paul wrote and said, no, 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 you can't kind of take some of the things that Jesus did and add them to your spirituality. You cannot take it. It's absolutely not 911. There's going to be casualty. You've got to know the gospel and it's going to offend. And can I say it's going to offend you and I? We're going to be offended. And we need to be able to swallow that. We need to understand that we have messed up up we cannot be good enough we've got to swallow that we cannot make ourselves good enough we cannot know the rules and achieve high enough the gospel is the very fact that you and i can't we can't perform enough action we can't attend church enough we can't read the bible enough we can't be kind to children enough we cannot do it on our own we cannot do it at all We can't do anything that will make us right with God because that sin has fractured that relationship. And nobody, it seems, wants to talk about that anymore in the church. So we have to make sure that we're doing this. And it hurts me, pastorally, but the bottom line is we can't afford to just be nice and lie to people. And then forget what Jesus said in Matthew 7. He's talking at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, and he's talking to the people, and he's he's finishing his sermon, and they're asking him, Jesus, you know, like, he's saying... People will come to me and they'll say, Lord, Lord, didn't we know you? And he said, I have to say, depart from me. I never knew you. That scares me and that keeps me awake as a pastor at night to know that that's something that we need to be doing. Ensuring that I've shepherded right or I've told right or I've made sure that I've gotten the gospel right. It's important. It's a big deal. And he says to these people, depart from me. It keeps you awake. I want to be not a nice pastor. I want to be a kind pastor. You've got a kind pastor. A Hellsborough Bible. And we're going to be kind pastors. And we're going to preach kind words. And we're going to be kind and loving. But we're going to be full of love. And we're going to be full of truth. We are not going to separate those two. Is that okay? Is that okay with you? As a church, we cannot separate those two. We have to do this, church. We've got to do this. Now, what we've got to understand is Jesus did this all the time. Go and read your Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You want to to read about Jesus doing some kindness, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. You look how Jesus operates, you're going to see him be kind. Y'all remember the story of the rich young ruler? The guy comes to him, he's following, he's coming after Jesus. He says, Jesus, I've kept all the commandments. What else do I need to do to be saved? And Jesus knows his heart. And he says, go sell everything you got. Super close. Go sell everything you got (laughs) and give it to the poor. Why? Jesus knew his heart. He knew he had something else going on in his heart. And Jesus said, You're super close, but just go sell everything you got. You're good. And what did that guy do? He walked away. He put his back to the Lord, and he walked away. This is what I love. 
And this is what's, what's so awesome, what's crazy about Jesus, is Jesus does not grovel. He doesn't. He doesn't, you know, like, oh, well, I don't want to sell everything. And Jesus does not, wait, 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 just sell half. Half? We good? Half? You come follow me. You sell half, you come follow me. Jesus, don't do that. Wait, 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 wait. No, 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 no. Just, just a little bit. Just a little bit. You come follow me. Just one widow's meal. One widow's meal. You pay for one widow's meal, you come follow me. Jesus doesn't do that. We need to understand that that is something that, as a character, Jesus is king. He is not going to grovel to you. We have to understand we are the ones that grovel to him. And we have to beg Him and thank Him and glorify Him for what He's done for us. He does not grovel. And if you're young in here, and, you, and you, let me tell you this, if you're young, if you're under 30 in this room, you, you, you have access to so much. Everybody has access, but I'm saying today, you have no more than today access to all the sermons and the preaching and the books. You have so much access. You can listen to a thousand sermons a week I listened to so many sermons. But back in the day, some of you remember, you had your Sunday sermon from your pastor, and then you could maybe get some cassettes from some people, right? <laughs> and then you had your TV preacher, and then you had your, maybe your Billy Graham on the big TV, right? That's it. That's all you had. But today, you can listen to so many different preachers, you can listen to so many different sermons. And here's, here's what I found is people love the inspirational preachers. They love them. But they don't submit themselves to any correction. Our world is full of people that want preaching, and they want to listen. It's good news, and you should be inspired. I'm not saying Jesus isn't inspiring. He is. He's the most inspiring. But I'm telling you this, Jesus would not sell out correction for inspiration. He's not simply just trying to build something here. Did you get that? He's not trying to build a big crowd. He's not trying to build a big church. He's trying to build big people. He's not building a big church. He's building a big people. And this is what God is doing. These last couple of years through COVID, I truly believe that's what He was doing. He was, he was building big people. And many churches, they didn't realize, probably until it's too late, but he was building big people. But there's, there's going to be another moment when we get to see thousands, tens of thousands, I believe, that are going to come to faith in Christ. But you know what? The gospel, for that moment to happen, you need to know the gospel. Because it's not just going to be on a Sunday morning with a good preach. It's going to be because you're sharing it in your home. And you're sharing it in your school, and you're sharing it in your work. And you're sharing it in your cul-de-sac, your apartment complex. It doesn't matter where it is. It's you know the gospel, and you're sharing it. You've got to know the gospel because God wants to make you a big Christian. He wants that for you. He doesn't grovel after the rich young ruler. He doesn't do that either with the woman in John chapter 4, the woman at the well. What does he do? He shows her a sin. He tells her a sin. And she receives it. She takes it in. She swallows it. And she goes back and tells the gospel to the whole town. She became a big person. She was a big person. And she was one ends up sharing the gospel with everyone back in town. And I love the, tra the sort of the interaction that the disciples have when they get back to Jesus and he's talking to a woman. And they ask him the questions like, what are you, what are you, what are you talking to this woman for? And I, Do you remember that story? And what does Jesus say? And as she's probably like leading hundreds of people out of town to come see Jesus, and he says to those disciples, look, the fields are white to harvest. The fields are white to harvest. And then... He, he probably reminds them, and I just told you a little bit ago, that the field are ready, but the laborers are few. We need some people that know the gospel. We need some people that know it, can answer that question and say, I can share this with somebody. 
No better time right now. So get ready. Get ready. So right now, I'm going to say to you, Hillsborough Bible Church, get ready. Get ready. There's so many people that are looking for good news in this world. Of the bad news, we cannot settle for being inspired. We've got to receive good gospel. That corrects us, encourages us, aligns us, calibrates us. Where are you today, church? That's the question I have for you. May 15th, where are you with the gospel? Now, some of you, maybe you're in this room and you heard the gospel for the first time. You heard that definition of the gospel. Wait, Jesus died for my sins? And all I have to do is faith in him? That's it. Believe in him. Trust in him. Call on him and he'll save you. Some of you in this room, you need to do that today. No better time than today to receive the gospel and accept what it says. Believe and trust in him. No better time than right now. We're going to give you an opportunity for that, but some of us here in this room, we've done that. We know we've done that. We know we know the gospel, and we've accepted and received it, but what are you doing with it? You need to get down on this altar, and you need to ask God, give me opportunity today. Give me opportunity this week to share the gospel. You know the gospel enough to share it. Come get on your face at this altar and ask God to give you opportunity. Share the gospel this week. Would you stand with me? All heads bowed, all eyes closed, as we have a time of invitation. I just want to invite you down here to get on your face. And I know that this altar, you know, it's not, it's just a regular altar. There's nothing special about this, but there is something special about getting on your face before your Lord and Savior. There's something special about getting on your face and saying, God, correct me today. There's something special about getting on your face and saying, I'm sorry, God. I'm sorry, Jesus. Thank you. Guide me. Maybe there's one, maybe there's two in here who would say, you know what, I have not done that in my life. I, I've maybe heard the gospel, but I have not accepted it. I have not received it. I have not said yes to Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Today is the day. Come down here. We're going to have people down at the front altars here to help you and love on you and share that with you. And you can have a chance to receive it this morning. As they start to play, come on down this morning. Don't take another moment to think, you know what, I'll push it off a little bit more. Maybe, maybe next week, maybe the week after. Stop that. That's a game. Don't play a game. Jesus will not grovel. You need to come to him. He's done everything else. You just need to come to him. Get down your face this morning. This is where the desperate soul finds hope. This is where the wayward heart finds home. This is where the weary find their strength again. This is where the broken lives where our emptiness is finally filled. Here in this holy moment, heaven's open, calling us close, calling us closer. is where glory meets us and mercy reaches calling us close calling us closer still so 
wonderful message uh, to hear about Jesus. Amen. Different styles and different people and different voices, but to hear about Jesus, what a wonderful voice that is. Amen. And the message he heard like that. We're not going to stop our invitation, so don't stop playing for us yet, okay? But I, I do want you to know that to get to hear a message about Jesus. changes every day of our life changes every day of our eternity what a message and did a great job we're going to have to ask his daddy to take lessons from his son for the preaching amen but don't pass up a message like this you know Jesus is needed everywhere we go everywhere we go I got to see a lot of people when I'm away and take a vacation in those hospital beds very interesting is a witness that I had. It was the most powerful journey I've had for a long time. One of the nurses said, I got to come back when nobody's here. Would you pray with me? You know, now that it took a, a shift to work its way through, but it's interesting to see her come back. And so God has you and I in a place where he wants us to be a witness. So I encourage you to do that, to be that witness that you all need to be. There's people like you and like me just waiting for someone to make it clear enough to get all of our heart so we can be saved. So don't leave this morning if you're unsaved. I encourage you when a message like this is a thinking message that he delivered. You'll have to think about it. And uh, if you think about it during the week, think about it. Get a chance to enjoy it. Let's sing another stanza. Let's say yes to the Lord. Would you do that with me? Say yes to him. Come on. On the sing. third verse, this is where we bow in humbleness. This is where we bow the Lord has to you. in humbleness. This is where you raise us up again. Nothing but your presence gives us confidence. Man, it's sure fun watching that, you know. Amen. Brother Dan, you look good in my jacket, buddy. You just don't have enough muscles there. Amen. Bethany, I'm sorry about him not knowing how to take care of his dirty clothes. I'm sorry about that. Amen. It's been good to be in the Lord house, Lord's house. Amen. 
If you're glad to receive these two men into the fellowship of this great church, let it be known with a heartfelt amen. Would you do that? Okay. Now we have a new responsibility to them. So we must find them. We must love them and give them us a place beside us. Amen? Let's just do that. Amen? Just a couple of announcements that we dismissed this morning. Our VBS is not far away. I'm one month away on June the 8th. So we're not. That's just around the corner. Tremendous, tremendous, tremendous VBS. We'll have the same thing, but except this year will be the extreme of that. And Joe's excited and we're excited. So find you a place to serve with us. It'll be a great time. The ladies have activity and outing, and uh, today's the last day to sign up. If you want to be a part of that, um, Laca Media on the 24th of June. Today is the last the last day. And then Grease Share is something that we've done now for seven weeks. It's been a tremendous blessing. I mean, tremendous blessing for those that have lost folk and uh, have sadness. What a time. These people have had such a tremendous time. Be part of that. You can't get there any time too late. Every time, every day is a good time. So be a part of that. Slash camps around the corner, truth camp, engage camps around the corner. Summer events are starting to come together. I want to invite you to join us, and uh, we'll give you the dates next week. We have Sunday nights in the summer. Why don't you come and be with us? So we have special, special activity, and you'll enjoy the teaching of that hour. That would be really good. Would you stand for us in prayer this morning? Mr. Nick, is that you back there? Is that, is that you? Is that your pretty wife that's right beside you? Okay, okay. Well, that's great. Good to see you. Amen. I look over the crowd, and I can see you. You're not moving when you're preaching. You're a moving target, but I can see you now. It's so good to see you folks this morning. I'm glad that you're here. I'm glad to be here. I'm going to be here tonight. Dan did a great job, didn't he not? Amen. And so let's be here tonight and support him. Wow. That's good. I like that. It'll probably make him feel a lot better if you give him a $10 bill as he'd leave this morning. He kind of likes that, you know, man. Well, let's make a prayer and we we'll dismiss. Okay, Troy, come and make the word short, Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this this day that you've blessed us with and that we can uh, pray to you, Lord. You hear our prayers and you know them, Lord. You, you walk beside us. You carry us, Lord. You guide us. You fill us with your wisdom. Father, we thank you for the indwelling of that Holy Spirit. We thank you for healing. And uh, Father, we thank you for the message that Daniel brought this morning. Lord, help us to, to, to feel that word and Lord, uh, take what, you'd, what you would give us from that message. Father, we pray for those that we've held up in prayer today, Lord, and we ask you to continue to be with them, Lord. Guide and protect these people as they go. Bring them back safely tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Can walk into a city I cannot see Through the depths of the valley where the sun can